Good to go. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Tech Talk with Tech Academy. Today we have a special guest. We have Chris Carter with us, who actually graduated from the Tech Academy. And he's going to be talking about his journey after graduation, give us some tips. So thank you so much for being here and take it away. Absolutely. Yeah, so last week was um, artificial super intelligence. Uh, and yeah, I don't think I can top that. In fact, I'm pretty sure I can't top that. Uh, but what I can do is uh, give you something maybe just as relevant, which is, or more relevant, uh, which is my story. You know, what happened to me after uh, Tech Academy? And, uh, you know, maybe they, maybe it'll happen for you too. So let me go ahead and share my presentation. There we are. All right. So this is my first five years after boot camp. And I'll start with uh, telling you my story. Uh, so I went to the Tech Academy between March and June of 2016 um, and got through, I think, in 11 weeks uh, because I was working pretty hard. I was putting in about 10-hour uh, days uh, every day. So uh, I powered through it. Um, this, was the, this was the curriculum at the time. Uh, and I think it looks you know, pretty similar right now, but there's certainly been changes. Uh, so it ended up with the job placement course, and afterwards I had signed up for an elective while I was uh, waiting to get a job, uh, the .NET MVC elective. Uh, and, you know, there were four important things about the Tech Academy. Um, first of all, it was self-paced and semi-independent. You know, you basically you start whenever you want to start. You don't have to wait for the next class cycle. Uh, and if you want to work hard, you can work hard and get through as quickly as you can. Um, and for the most part, you know, it guides you through learning. But there are a lot of times when you have to kind of figure out how to implement what it's asking you. You know, particularly at the end of each module, it'll have a project and says, you know, do this. And you've got to figure that out. And that was really important, learning you know, how to you solve problems in IT? What are the resources out there? Uh, and that made, uh, gave me a real, a real leg up. So the fact that it was sort of semi-independent uh, was important for a couple of reasons. Um, also, uh, I met a great recruiter uh, who gave a tech talk while I was uh, in, uh, in class. Uh, and Carlotta was, you know, clearly, uh, outstanding. She was smart. She was dedicated to what she was doing. And I definitely asked for her card at the end of the tech talk. Uh, and she ended up being really uh, key to my success later on. Um, the live project was also crucial. You know, I got to work on a real live commercial website. Um, and it was, uh, you know, fairly complex. And I got my hand in a lot of .NET MVC and got to see how it worked. And I got to implement uh, you know, three or four different features uh, while I was on the live project. Uh, and that was kind of fun. You can you know, pull up the website after it's been uh, deployed and you can say, oh, look, I, I did that feature. Um, but when it came time to interview, it gave me a lot of experience to talk about uh, that really went a long way. Uh, and finally, the job placement course was really outstanding. Uh, you know, I was certainly no stranger to uh, looking for jobs and writing resumes, uh, but writing a resume for IT was new to me. And the formatting that was suggested in the job placement course, you know, clearly uh, improved my resume right away. You know, I could tell it that it was, yeah, this is much better after I uh, do it the way Tech Academy is suggesting. Um, and in the job placement course, they also kind of walk you through the whole process. You know, get a uh, get a GitHub account, get your own uh, website up, uh, call two recruiters, and one of which was was Carlotta, who had given the tech talk. Uh, and so I just basically followed that recipe, and uh, I think pretty much the the week that I was going to start my elective, the .NET uh, MVC course, I got uh, a contract. Uh, Carlotta got me a contract at Intel. Um, it was 12 months and it was later extended to 18 months, which is the maximum that they do um, because they don't want you to look like a, like a full employee uh, just for tax reasons. Um, 
And, you know, there I was lucky enough to have uh, Uday as my lead uh, and mentor. And he contributed a lot to, to my later success. <clears throat> you know, he's a super smart guy, very nice, and shared a lot of his knowledge with me. Uh, it was never really clear, uh, you know, whether I should say that I, I work at Intel contracting through Vanderhuen, uh, who was the staffing company. Uh, or whether I worked at Vanderhuen and I was contracting at Intel, uh, you do kind of live in a in a strange uh, hybrid environment uh, as a contractor. Uh, you're employed by Vanderhuen, uh, the, the staffing company, and so your pay and your benefits all come through them. But you go to work at Intel, and all of your colleagues are Intel, and and so. You know, the, the work environment and culture is all Intel. So from day to day, it kind of feels like you're working at Intel. Uh, so I always thought, uh, you know, Intel is my primary uh, employer at the time, even though technically you're working for, for the staffing company, Mander Hewen. Uh, so what did I do? So I'm, I'm right out of boot camp. And uh, Uday started me off with a kind of a warm up project. There had been a new application that had gone into production. Uh, and it had worked in testing, but it wasn't working in production. And so I needed to kind of figure out why that was. And uh, it was a great warm up and a great introduction to their code base. Um, and it turns out uh, that I was able to figure out that the issue was that the development environment was only a single server, whereas in production, it was on a forest of servers. And when it would switch from server to server, it would lose state. And so we had to figure out a solution to that and implement that. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, and it got me ready for my main project. And that was to write an application uh, to help the quality assurance team at Intel go around to its suppliers uh, from, from all over the world, uh, places with good internet access, places where they would be outside of internet coverage, um, and make inspections of these factories and uh, track the quality issues that arose uh, to resolution. Uh, and this was cool because this was a green field project. In other words, you know, you start with a, a field full of grass and you get to do the groundbreaking and you get to design and build the whole thing uh, from nothing. So I got to gather the requirements and identify the stakeholders and architect the solution and code the solution and then go ahead and test it and deploy it. The whole, the whole life cycle ended up kind of being mine. And that was a superb opportunity. Uh, what it turned out to be was a web application uh, backed up by a database uh, that would be the primary source of information. But because the inspectors were going to places where they wouldn't necessarily have internet access, they couldn't rely on the web app. And so I wrote a, a Windows app that would go on their laptops. And then I wrote a web service that would synchronize the two. So basically when they got back to, uh, to the Intel office, they could log in from their Windows app and synchronize all of the findings on their inspection uh, through the web service uh, into the database. And then from there, once they were at their desk, they could uh, be at the web app to go ahead and resolve issues uh, that, uh, that followed up from their inspections. Uh, and there was an inspection scheduler and a team builder. It was pretty fun. Um, and uh, and that's, that took uh, a good portion of my 18 months to write that. Uh, but as that was going through testing and deployment, uh, I had a lot of downtime. Uh, where I wasn't uh, doing a lot of coding. It was in other people's hands. And so at that point, I got to help uh, my teammates with uh, some work that they were doing, updating an existing web app. So I got to work uh, a couple different times on existing code and got to write my own code uh, for the rest of the time. Uh, and finally, I got to add a unit uh, test framework to a JavaScript app uh, that Intel publishes, which lets uh, OEMs like uh, Dell or Lenovo uh, tune their thermal management on their devices. So basically it says, you know, take the input from these thermal sensors and run the fan at 65% uh, until the temperature gets to here and then run it at 80%. Uh, 
Uh, so, um, you know, when, uh, whenever I hear my fans spin up on my laptop, I think, oh yeah, I worked on that software. That's pretty cool. Um, and if you're thinking that that was a lot to do right out of boot camp, you are right. <laughs> I was, I was out of boot camp and right into the fire. Um, and, uh, and you know, I did have imposter syndrome for the, about the first six months. Uh, you know, people talk about imposter syndrome as being bad, um, but you know, it's not necessarily, um, you know, it's, it's natural. You're starting a new career and, uh, you know, you, there's a lot of learning and a lot of catching up. And so for the first six months, I put in a lot of 10 hour days working through lunch, came home and researched topics that, uh, that were bothering me. Uh, from the from the daytime, so I'd be ready to work on them the next day. Uh, so I I worked super hard for those six months, and and that's because yeah, you do have imposter syndrome. You you are, um, you know, taking on a new role, and it takes a lot of work to do that at first. No, um, but it's fun, um, and and in reality, um, I did feel pretty well prepared by the Tech Academy. I mean, I I was stressed. But uh, I wasn't panicked because, you know, I found that coming out of Tech Academy, I knew a little bit about everything that I needed to know. Um, and certainly enough to guide me in the right direction as far as researching uh, the rest. So, uh, you know, I knew about the code. I knew about, uh, you know, the underlying server behavior. I knew about uh, a little bit about testing. Um, so everything sounded very familiar. Um, so, you know, I felt, uh, I felt like, yeah, this is, this is something I can do. Uh, I'm going to have to work to figure it out, but, but this is something I can do. And at least I know what they're talking about. Uh, and most importantly, you know, as I said earlier, uh, I learned at Tech Academy how to figure out the solution. Where are the resources, uh, that you can Google, uh, where are the books that, uh, you can go to, to figure out how do you implement this? And, and there were often uh, days when I would be going to work knowing what I needed to implement that day and having no idea how I was going to do it. <laughs> you know, I, I know what feature I'm going to work on today, and I have no idea how I'm going to accomplish that. And you just sit down at your desk and you just start doing it. And at the end of the day, you go, oh, I did that. How did that happen? Um, and you just do it. Uh, so, you know, I felt like I really had the right tools uh, to be productive. So that was really great. So how am I coming through so far? No, nope. sounds great. Excellent, excellent. Um, there were a few things that actually that I had not learned at Tech Academy. Uh, <clears throat> so here's the, here's the dirt right here. Um, so what do you not learn at Tech Academy? And I wanted to kind of pause it at a blank screen here just to say that I don't think that anybody learns these things until they get out in the real world. I don't think the people who come out with a computer science degree learn these things. I don't think that any boot camp teaches them. You know, I think that these are just things that you have to, uh, to get on the job experience with. Um, and the first one is testing. Uh, you know, unit testing, integration testing. Uh, you certainly learn about the, the concepts uh, at uh, Tech Academy, but, uh, you know, learning how to really implement it and write your own tests, uh, I think that just takes practice. And so, you know, when you're working on, on a commercial project uh, for an employer, uh, this is when you really get exposed to that. Even bigger is, you know, we, you learn how to write code, whether it's a computer science degree or a boot camp, uh, you learn a lot about how to write code, but you don't learn a lot about the practical difficulties of, well, how do you actually get it out into the world? Like, it, okay, you've got this great code on your machine. Um, how are other people going to see it? Uh, and you know, how, you, how you actually <clears throat> get that published uh, up to a web server and maintain that web server um, is, is all stuff that, uh, again, you kind of have to be in that environment and uh, and practice it there. Uh, but there are some things you can do for yourself and I'll talk about those later. But that's a biggie is, you know, how not how do you write code, but how do you get the code out into the world? 
All right, so what happened after Intel? Five months of unemployment. I thought, well, you know, here I had this very successful uh, track record at uh, Intel, which has a certain cachet to it. I can speak to a lot of exciting and sophisticated things I've done, and uh, things are going to be and and things went so smooth, right? I mean, I got my Intel uh, gig right out of Tech Academy, and so I'm just going to move right into my next uh, my next job. Well. My contract ended right during the holiday season, and that was the first problem. Uh, and so you basically got about six weeks where no one's particularly hiring. But then it just kept going on and on, you know, apply, 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 have an interview, more applications, maybe another interview, put in a whole bunch more applications. Um, all I could say that's good about that is that uh, at the first uh, part, you're just putting in a ton of applications. And towards the end, all of a sudden, uh, you're getting more interviews. And there would be a lot of weeks when I would do, you know, a couple interviews. One week, I think I did three interviews in the week. Uh, and so, um, you know, at least you're getting some interest. And that makes a big difference. Um, and in fact, there is a silver lining to this. I would have to say that those five months, I grew professionally more than I grew at any other time. Um, it was actually a really valuable experience. Um, for one thing, I interviewed a lot. I, I had a lot of interviews and I was asked a lot of questions that I didn't really know the answer to. Um, and it's okay uh, to say, I don't know. Um, but, you know, today's I don't know uh, is tonight's study topic. So you go home and you say, man, I don't know. That was a good question. Uh, and I did a lot of studying guided by things that I was asked on interviews. Uh, and, you know, the next interview you go to, uh, you know, you can nail that question. Um, and in fact, a lot of, a lot of knowledge base I have is because of, of stuff that came up on interviews. Uh, presumably they're asking you because it's important. Uh, so interviewing a lot was great. Uh, I also coded a lot. I mean, I was unemployed. So what else are you going to do, right? Uh, so I ended up probably just, you know, getting my morning coffee and going down to the office and, and coding for about 14 hours every day. And, uh, so you're, you're putting in, uh, applications and they're having, uh, they're either having, uh, code, uh, challenges for you to do, or you read the, uh, the description of the job and, and they use, uh, some, technology that you haven't used before, Dapper, for example. And so you're like, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and download that to my machine. I'm going to write a little demonstrator project using Dapper. And so you do. And so I ended up writing projects in C Sharp and C++ and in Java and Go. Uh, I did pro uh, projects in Angular and React. I used a NoSQL database. Uh, I put things in Docker containers and uh, put them up to AWS and manage them with Kubernetes uh, in a cluster. So I just did, I did a bunch of stuff. And so, you know, today I can say, you know, a lot of the practical knowledge I have is because of that period of unemployment where I was just coding all sorts of stuff, you know, whatever, whatever technology the, uh, the position I had applied for was using, I would go ahead and, and try coding with that. Um, but it got along, and eventually I said, well, with all this coding I'm doing, I might as well you know, do it for a company, even if it's my own company. Uh, and so I did. I started Proficient Software. Uh, and in fact, I got a client and got to write a real-world e-commerce site. Uh, so, you know, it, it shows products. <clears throat> it uh, interfaces with a credit card payment uh, portal. So it actually takes money and uh, keeps your uh, order in a database. And, so yeah, it was a real, real full e-commerce site. Um, and I have to say that uh, that contract that I got, uh, I got through some uh, contacts that I had at Tech Academy. So they helped me out a lot, uh, even during this time. But eventually I did get uh, my next uh, contract. Uh, it was a six month contract, which was extended to 12 months at US Bank. Uh, and it was working on their lockbox service. <clears throat> So basically, if you uh, send in a paper coupon and check, uh, 
to a company like PGE, for example, uh, it probably doesn't go to PGE where a whole bunch of Oompa Loompas are in there opening envelopes and extracting checks. Um, in a lot of cases, it actually goes to a U.S. bank processing center uh, where they have huge machines that can just rip open a thousand uh, envelopes an hour. Um, and so they'll scan it and process the payment and send the details off to the payee. Uh, and they'll go ahead and, and make all the debits and credits uh, in their own mainframe system directly. Uh, so that's a lockbox service. And uh, so I was tasked as a contractor with writing an application which would allow the administrators of the lockbox system to look at their structure, their infrastructure. Uh, in other words, what, uh, what network addresses were doing what? What servers were associated with which pods? Which pods were associated with which cities? Um, and so, you know, initially it was just CRUD, like, you know, go ahead and and uh, just enter the details of a server and it'll store it in the database and then it'll show it to you in different contexts. Uh, and then later I learned how to do network scanning and how to use uh, Ansible to uh, monitor the status of individual machines. And so I was able to make a dashboard that would show you the real time uh, status of all of the machines uh, and give you your know, red, yellow and, and green lights. <clears throat> And so I learned a lot of a lot of cool tricks. Um, learned a lot about operating in Linux because most of these were Linux machines. Uh, and so, you know, it got me out of the .NET world, out of the out of the Windows world, and uh, into that whole whole other world. Um, and again, this was a greenfield project. Uh, I got to uh, do the requirements definition. I got to do the architecture. I got to write all of the code. I got to lead the testing. I got to uh, essentially do all the deployment. And by this time, you know, I had deployed my project at Intel. And now I knew a little bit more about deploying the project and uh, you know, felt a lot more confident about uh, you know, taking this live. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I was asked to, uh, to join permanently. So I finally reached that, that coveted state in IT of a permanent job, not just a contract. Um, and so that was very exciting. Um, I uh, was continuing to work on the lockbox system, but this time I was doing something a little bit different. Uh, you know, as a, as a permanent employee, you're a lot more involved in maintaining the, uh, the structures. I think that a lot of companies will bring on contractors to do new projects, uh, but maintaining the existing, uh, software base is, uh, primarily the the task of the permanent employees. And so, uh, you know, I was still writing some new code, but I was also writing uh, Perl scripts, which would translate the output of the lockbox system to a custom format that the payees required uh, to ingest that uh, information. I was writing C++, uh, little, uh, little apps that would modify system behaviors. Uh, so the system would, would emit an event and these, these apps would uh, would trigger on those events, and they would make some some change. Uh, so all of a sudden, I was writing in Perl and C plus plus. That was new, um, but my main project was yet another greenfield project. Uh, and I've had extraordinarily good luck in that I've had these greenfield projects all along the way that have enabled me to um, to do architecture and systems engineering and you know do a lot of decision making. You know beyond beyond my experience. Uh, and so I've grown a lot because of that. Uh, and this one was to help the, uh, the bank accurately bill its government clients for the lockbox services that it made. Uh, and it ended up being a you know, pretty, pretty involved uh, application. Uh, and finally, we did some exploratory projects, uh, which were in .NET, uh, converting paper forms to digital and then transmitting to a highly secured uh, SOAP service. So I, I learned more about security and I learned, this is where I finally learned about Windows Communication Foundation and how do you, how do you communicate with a secured SOAP service? And that ended up being really valuable in my next step. I had no idea the next step was even coming, uh, but uh, you know, this turned out to be uh, a stroke of luck that I had just learned about uh, Windows Communication Foundation. 
Another exploratory project was uh, scanning an email mailbox, extracting any image attachments that would come in, converting the format to different image formats, and then transmitting the files off. Uh, so you're learning new tricks. You know, you're learning um, you know, different inputs. You know, now I can, I can reach out to other systems and I can grab files. I could reach out to, to mailboxes and get files. I know uh, some new libraries that will convert PDFs. Uh, so you're learning just new tricks. And every new trick that you learn uh, means that there are you know, four or five different things that are kind of like that. And you can say, well, I haven't done that, but it's just like this other thing that I've done. So your, uh, your experience base gets, uh, gets broadened pretty quick. Uh, and then just recently, about a month ago, uh, I moved over to Genesis Financial Solutions, um, which is crazy because U.S. Bank is a great company. I loved being there. In fact, I've loved you know, all the companies I've worked for. Um, I don't have uh, enough good to say about them. They've all been fantastic. Um, but uh, at Genesis, uh, there are some special things uh, that I've found. Uh, first of all, they issue and service credit cards, essentially. Uh, and I was brought in to help them on a big project that they're working on, converting their traditional on-premises system to a service-oriented uh, system in the cloud uh, in Azure. So this is a really, really big conversion, uh, and there's kind of a deadline on it, and the deadline's coming up fast. It's been a real kind of a pain point for them, and they, you know, they really needed somebody who could get on board and start being productive pretty quickly. So, you know, what they really needed was they needed to find a Tech Academy graduate. So they reached out to me. And uh, and so I just started and um, and it's been really fun. I, I enjoy uh, the stress of the deadline coming up and a lot of work to do and, and having to to jump in and just learn this code base and be productive, uh, you know, from not the first day, but from the second week, uh, which has been been pretty fun. Um, and I'm part of a larger team. Uh, and we're using more formalized software development methodologies. <clears throat> um, and so I'm learning really how to interact in a, in a more sophisticated environment that way. And of course, I'm learning new technologies like cloud. <clears throat> you know, that had been a big, a big hole in, uh, in what I'd done so far as I, I hadn't gotten any real cloud experience except for what I'd done on my own uh, while I was unemployed. So, you know, this is a great opportunity to really do uh, production work in, in the cloud. So that's my story to date. <clears throat> um, when you think about, you know, what do developers do? Uh, you know, junior developers, people just getting in, you know, talk about, uh, you know, wanting to do a lot of different things. Artificial super intelligence, for uh, example, game development, or working on self-driving cars. Uh, big data is very, uh, very sexy. Uh, you know, taking you know, millions of data points and mapping them and applying machine learning to them. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, I haven't done any of these sexy things <laughs> at all. Um, although my, uh, my girlfriend did machine learning, so it's out there. There are obviously people doing these things. But I think that my experience uh, has been uh, probably more representative of what your average bread and butter software uh, engineer does. Uh, we make the world go round. Uh, you know, I helped Intel make chips. Uh, I, uh, I help people uh, buy products off of an e-commerce site. Uh, I help people apply for and make transactions on credit cards and, uh, you know, get their, uh, get their bills paid through the mail uh, and, you know, move money around the financial system. <clears throat> so, um, you know, if you think about it, it's like, yeah, I, this is, uh, this is actually good, important stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's, kind of mundane, but uh, it does make the world go around. And, you know, every time I uh, lick a stamp and put it on a check, I think, oh, <clears throat> I wrote some of the software that's going to going to process that. Um, and it's a it's a really fun field to be in. Uh, there's a huge variety of work uh, if you want it. If you don't want it, uh, there are certainly jobs where uh, you're maintaining fixed code bases and doing you know kind of the same thing uh, all the time. But if you want variety, um, you know, as you can tell from my experience, I've done a ton of things with a ton of uh, 
different technologies in different domains. Uh, and it's just always something new. Uh, and even if the work that you're doing doesn't change, the technologies that you're using uh, almost always will be constantly changing because new technologies are coming out all the time and they're getting better and better all the time. <clears throat> so, you know, life just keeps getting better for a software engineer. Better tools every year. Um, new puzzles and challenges. Once again, even if you're working with the same stuff, uh, you know, you're always being forced with, to, to deal with little, um, little things to figure out. Uh, sometimes big things to figure out. Uh, sometimes you, uh, you hit the books and you've got to study a whole new technology. Um, so, you know, you're, you're constantly, uh, exercising your brain and, and there's a lot of play, you know, you, you know, how did, why is this not working? I don't know. Let me, let me change this thing and see what happens. And you're just playing around with it and seeing, seeing how it responds. Um, and that is something I did not have in my previous career. Um, but, you know, you, you, feel, uh, you feel young again uh, in software engineering because you're always just playing with stuff. Um, you're also, there's also a really strong tradition of craftsmanship and perfection. Uh, you know, I've been uh, kind of rebuilding my house as I've been doing all this stuff too. And uh, building software is kind of the same, the same feel. You know, you want to, you want to make it not good enough, but you want to make it, you know, just right. You want to, you know, think about all the different ways you could build this and then, uh, and then go ahead and choose the best way and uh, get all the, all the rough edges off of it. And then at the end of the day, you go home and you go, man, that was that was some really beautiful code that, uh, that I ended up with at the end of the day. I may have had to put in 11 hours today, but when you go home, uh, you go home with a real feeling of satisfaction of having, uh, you know, having built something beautiful. Um, and there's a lot of teamwork. I mean, this can be a plus or a minus depending on, <clears throat> on your personality, a lot of teamwork and mentorship involved. Um, you know, you don't think about that, uh, in software engineering, you think of just writing code, but, um, but everyone has to get together and be on the same page. So, uh, you know, as, as you go up from being a junior to a senior, you end up uh, mentoring a lot of people more junior to you uh, and teaming up on the same code uh, frequently. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a big part of it. And meetings are a big part of it. Uh, again, you wouldn't imagine meetings would be such a big part of the job. Um, that's one thing I was told at Tech Academy is, you know, don't imagine that you're just going to go to work and write code for eight hours a day. Uh, you're going to have a lot more meetings than you think. And, uh, and that's true. Uh, you know, there's certainly days when I've got three hours of meetings out of the eight hours. And it's not bad. It's fun. But uh, I think that just having heard about it uh, prepares you for that reality. So a lot of teamwork, a lot of meetings. <clears throat> uh, and that's my story. Uh, so, uh, I thought I'd, uh, in part two, talk about, you know, what advice would I give, uh, to, uh, to write your story? Um, so let's start with the path. Uh, most people start out as a junior developer, which means that they can perform basic coding tasks with direction. Um, but, you know, basically you're saying, you know, here's, here's a model of what I want you to do. Now go ahead and, and do the same thing here, 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 and here. Um, then as you move on to a mid-level, uh, it means you can code with minimal direction. Um, and that's kind of where I was at Intel. Uh, I started as a software uh, developer too. And was basically said, hey, we need, a, we need an application that does this. Go do it. Uh, so you know, they, they don't really lay it out too much. Uh, and they, but it, as a mid-level, you can, you can pretty much just kind of write the code, uh, with, with only occasional direction, uh, in terms of, you know, how do you want to implement this or how, how do you want this architected? How is it going to fit in with the, with the existing code base? Um, from mid-level, you move on to senior developer and, and I don't think that, uh, I've found a consensus on what senior developer really means. There are a lot of opinions, uh, but I was able to tease out four themes, you know, what makes a senior developer? Uh, first of all, uh, technical proficiency. Uh, you should be pretty proficient uh, with whatever language you're working in and, and be able to implement some sophisticated uh, little tricks in that. Um, but you should also have a lot of breadth. You should know 
a lot about the different libraries uh, that are available uh, and, and what, what options are available for doing what needs to be done. Because uh, a, a lot of what you do uh, is done with tools that have been developed by other people. And you just need to, um, to have some time in the saddle to learn about them, to have heard about them and to have tried them out. Um, so that technical proficiency allows you to manage and mentor more junior developers. And uh, you'll find that depending on the team, you end up doing more and more of that as you go up. And, and that can be really rewarding. Um, also, uh, a senior developer has uh, more professional judgment. Uh, and this is where that breadth of knowledge comes in. Uh, you know, you, not only can you, can you make a solution, but you can think about different solutions and you can compare them. You know, it, you know this one's going to be faster to, to write and we're under, uh, under the gun, but this one is going to be more robust and extensible over time and easier to maintain, you know, which, which fits uh, our needs best at this point. Uh, you know, there are three different uh, libraries that we could use to get this job done, which one fits the best. Um, you know, should we spend a lot of time optimizing this right now, uh, or should we wait to see if it's good enough and then optimize it later if we need to? So a lot more than just kind of writing code, but, uh, you know, choosing between different approaches to writing code. Um, and then finally, uh, it's the ability to create a whole solution and not just write code. Uh, so, you know, you have to have some idea, I think as a senior, but you know, how do you architect the whole solution? What pieces need to be in place? Uh, how would you design the database? Um, and then now that you've got <clears throat> this, uh, this code in place, how are you going to get it up to the server and how are you going to get the server to talk to the database? So beyond the code, it's managing the whole infrastructure that's involved in having a working software application. And you know, as you move up to more senior, uh, that becomes a uh, more old hat. So how do you get there? Uh, so my suggest, I have a few suggestions. Um, first of all, pick a major. Uh, you don't want to spread yourself too thinly. I've heard this from uh, a number of recruiters that uh, you know you shouldn't have a, a resume that's full of C sharp and Java. Uh, you should either be a .NET developer or you should be a Java developer. But if you do both, then people think that uh, that you're probably a little bit superficial in both of them. <clears throat> so just decide kind of what you want to do in, in uh, software engineering and really concentrate on that. Become an expert. Uh, you know, for example, if you want to be a general full stack developer uh, like myself, uh, you'll almost certainly have to know SQL. Uh, and you'll almost certainly have to know JavaScript. I find over time that more and more JavaScript ends up on my on my pages. Um, and uh, and then for your main code, uh, pick either C sharp or Java. Uh, you'll at least, unless there have been major changes at Tech Academy, uh, you'll learn C sharp at Tech Academy. But they're so similar um, that you could teach yourself Java after graduating from Tech Academy and, and make that switch if you want to be a Java developer. Um, and Java developers tend to make a little bit more money, but it's also uh, harder to find more uh, junior positions in the Java world. So it's a trade-off. Um, I kind of think it's six one half does the other. Uh, I've certainly cast my fate into the uh, c -sharp .net world. But uh, <clears throat> you know, pick one or the other. Um, if you want to be web only, uh, I am told that uh, PHP, good old uh, venerable PHP, is still very much in demand. There's a lot of code base. Um, you're kind of limiting yourself to, to web development, but um, you know if you want to be in that niche, PHP could be uh, a good uh, place to be. Uh, if you want to do mobile development, you should pick Swift or Java, depending on whether you want to be uh, uh, an iPhone developer or an Android developer. Uh, if you're really interested in data science and you want to commit yourself to that niche, uh, then Python is where to be. Uh, and if you want to do gaming or embedded software, then C++ is, is the way to go. Uh, at least those are my, uh, my suggestions based on my limited experience. But the point is that, you know, pick something and become a real expert at that. 
and then as you find related technologies then branch out <clears throat> uh, second thing is study and practice outside of work hours and you know when you're looking for work this is super easy because you, know, you wake up and you got nothing to do and hopefully you like coding <laughs> or maybe maybe you're in the wrong place already um, so if you like coding and you got nothing to do uh, you end up doing a lot of coding and that's great uh, but when you get a job and you're working full time, it is really, really hard uh, to do stuff outside of work hours. Um, but I found as time went on, I was not doing this and I was really falling behind. So you, know, you have to maintain that passion for IT and uh, and study uh, you know, outside of work and and practice outside of work uh, for study. Uh, books, both books and videos are useful. Um, for videos, there's uh, YouTube, and then there are pay sites like Pluralsight and LinkedIn Learning. Uh, surprisingly, I think the highest, some of the highest quality stuff uh, I found on YouTube. There are some really smart people doing, uh, you know, series of videos on on YouTube. Um, but uh, if you want to learn something like a new language, um, having an organized uh, course structure like Pluralsight or LinkedIn can be useful. Um, and I'll talk more about books later. Um, and, uh, you know, go ahead and practice. Uh, practice stuff that you, you know, all that stuff that you don't do at work, all the technologies that your company is not uh, doing. Um, you know, simple console apps. Uh, if you want to try out different concepts, you know, I, I need to see how this whole threading thing works, or I need to practice uh, uh, publishing and consuming events uh, or, um you know, I want to try a, a Signal R application. Um, just real simple console app that way. But also build full stack apps. <clears throat> don't don't just write a whole bunch of little things. Uh, you know, build at least one full end to end. You know, it starts at a website. Uh, it reaches out to a database. It allows you to manipulate things in the database. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have a, a web service over here that it calls to do some logic and then and then comes back. Um, so, you know, write a, a whole real enterprise uh, type architecture uh, application. So something something big, um, because that's the kind of stuff that you're going to be doing in practice uh, is seeing how all those pieces go together. Um, then keep your finger on the pulse of IT. Uh, you know, what, what's new out in the IT world and what's important? Um, and this also can be hard because, you know, when you, uh, especially once you get a job, you're primarily looking at, at whatever technologies your company is using. And it's very easy to, uh, to lose awareness of, of, you know, what the most modern technologies are and, and what people are going to be asking for next time you're in the job market. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, well, first of all, interviewing. I love interviewing because uh, they ask you all sorts of questions that occasionally uh, take you by surprise. Like I hadn't even heard about that. Uh, so you know that can be very useful. Uh, even in, before the interview, just looking at the job description, uh, you know we we do this and we use these technologies. Um, oh, they're using a, no, a NoSQL database. You know, that's the that's the second job description I've seen with a NoSQL database. You know, let me go ahead and download a NoSQL database and see what this is all about. Uh, so interviewing is great. Um, also joining professional groups. Uh, and you know, there are a number of them in the area. Uh, I primarily spend my time at Padnug, which uh, used to be the Portland area .NET users group. Uh, and has since been rebranded as simply Padnug. Uh, but you know, that's a place where you meet a lot of really smart people uh, and a lot of people who have been in the industry and in your niche of the industry for a long time. Uh, so that's fantastic. Um, third, uh, get a cloud account. Uh, you know, I said before that one of the things that you're not going to get uh, until you really get experience is how do I get my code up to a remote server? And maintain it there, and, uh, and administer it, and and keep it uh, keep it going. So I uh, you know, uh, I start out uh, with a GoDaddy account. Uh, you get an Azure account uh, or an AWS account, and put things up there. And uh, I've had all three now. 
um, and practice deploying your apps uh, up there. Um, this is huge. This is the part that you're not going to get uh, at university and you're not going to get a boot camp uh, very much anyway. Uh, so yeah, get a cloud account and put your stuff up there and, um, and practice working with it remotely. Um, and I see we're getting a little short on time, so I'll just go through this real quickly, but consider contracting. Um, I think that, you know, my experience contracting was hugely successful for me. I was able to get exposed to a lot of different approaches and companies and technologies and projects very quickly. Uh, cause you know, you, you do a contract, you do something, then you're on to the next project and you doing that. Um, and like I said earlier, contractors tend to be brought in for new projects. So you get a little bit more chance to work on a greenfield project and do a little bit of the architecting and a little bit of the deployment, um, <clears throat> with that. Um, as a contractor, you're not really part of the team. You know, you, you're brought in to write some code. And so you tend to write a little bit more code and have a few less meetings uh, than the permanent employees, and that can be a plus. Um, and some people like contracting because they can take, you know, three months off a year. So I work for nine months, and then I just don't look for a new job immediately after my contract expires. Um, there are downsides. Uh, you don't have the job security. <laughs> you know, remember that five months of unemployment, that was painful. Um, and you're not really part of the team. Uh, you know, they, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of meetings that they'll say, well, you know, the, the permanent employees are invited to the meeting and the contractors are, um, not needed in this meeting. So, um, you're mostly part of the team, but there are little reminders that you're not fully part of the team. And, um, that can either bother you or not bother you depending, um, but that's one of the cons. Um, a lot of people will say to me and get a hub account. I'm not convinced that this ever made a huge difference for me, but you will be asked if you have a GitHub account. Um, I don't know if people actually look at it or not, but at the very least, uh, it's a, a, a chance to show people what you can do <clears throat> with your code and, and the sophistication of your code uh, before you have a lot, uh, a long track record of achievement to point to. Uh, GitHub is something that you will use uh, professionally, so it gets you used to that. <clears throat> and uh, just be sure that, you know, if this is going to be part of your, your portfolio, that uh, maybe you go ahead and, and redo some of your earlier work to make it more representative of, of what you can do now. And oh, right on time, this is the last slide. Um, so I promised I would, uh, you know, share some of the resources that uh, I have in terms of books. And these are four books, I think, that have made a big difference for me. Uh, the first one, ASP.NET, NBC5. Um, was the first book that guided me through writing .NET. And uh, what uh, Adam Freeman does there is he has an e-commerce site. And I just went through and I wrote that e-commerce site uh, as he presents it in the book. And, you know, wrote this component, then add this component, then add this component. And by the end of that book, I knew how to write a full uh, MVC uh application. So it really gave you the big picture. Uh, design patterns. Uh, this is classic. This is the gang of four book that you will hear about. Uh, you will hear about this in the Tech Academy curriculum. Um, and this is classic. You will be asked about this book uh, in interviews. Probably 50% of your interviews, you'll be asked about this book. So uh, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> writing software. This is a new one for me. I've only gone through about the first fifth of it. Um, but this is starts to get you involved in larger organization of code. Uh, and and how, do you, how do you write code that's going to be extensible over time and is modularized? Uh, and this is a pretty highly regarded book, so I would, I would recommend this one. And then finally, when you're talking about putting together code at the largest levels of of uh, organization, uh, then uh, I really like Martin Fowler, who who was a name in and of itself in uh, in the software engineering world. Uh, Martin Fowler's book, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture, uh, and this is this is how you write large code structures. Uh, so if you read these four, I think you'll be well along in uh, in understanding how to write code and how to organize code.
And with that, that's kind of what I had to say. All right, great presentation, Chris. Really uh, good insight to the path to success after graduation. And uh, it's uh, definitely a great story and really good to see you. Um, it's fun. Now, there was a graduate, it was five to six <clears throat> years ago, a graduate went to work for Genesis. His name was Chase Swanson. He was the one I mentioned earlier. So just keep that name in mind, Chase Swanson. He may be off on another um, venture by now. We have a Chris Swanson, I believe. No, I'm sorry, Chris Stewart. So, gotcha. yeah. Yeah, the name doesn't sound familiar. Okay. Well, Regina, we've got a good amount of questions. Do you uh, want to take a stab at those? <clears throat> yes. First one's, first one's at 109 with Marlon. All right. It says your first contract was tamed through networking, right? Um, Kind of, and kind of just through Tech Academy. Uh, I mean, I, I went to these Tech Talks. There was a very impressive recruiter. The job placement course said... Um, find two recruiters and work with them. So I did. And uh, next thing you know, she had a job for me. So uh, I would say that, no, I did not go out and network a lot. Um, it was, I just kind of followed the recipe uh, that was given to me uh, at Tech Academy. Now I was, I was fortunate though, in that uh, one of the Tech Talks had this really outstanding recruiter that made a big difference uh, in my career. Um, you may have to go out and and you know find recruiters on your own, but um, they'll find you too. So no, I actually did not do a lot of networking. That has not been part of what I do. All right. Uh, next question: Is everything included here based on .NET? Uh, yeah, I'm a .NET developer. So yeah, basically that's that's my major. Um, I've done a few things that uh, lie outside that. I did that project uh, at Intel where I was working in, in the application that was completely written in JavaScript. And I put on the test, the Jasmine uh, test harness on that. Um, but otherwise, everything has been in the .NET world, yeah. Well, no, actually, that's not true. Um, at US Bank, um, I ended up doing mostly .NET. But the, the bread and butter work that my team did and that I participated in was writing Perl scripts in Linux shell and writing C++ applications. So, um, so actually, yeah, a substantial part of that job was, was outside of .NET. Okay, okay. so um, going through your Tech Academy school days, did you ever feel guilty for reaching out for help on something you were stuck on or did you just reach out? Oh, I'm not shy. Um, no, you really, you know, I was in the middle of a, of a career change. And so the heat was on. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I put in, I came in, I sat down and 10 hours later, I got up and went home. And if I had questions, I would ask questions. You know, Rick can attest to that. He was the, the uh, target of a lot of my questions. Um, a lot of questions. You were not shy. I'm not shy. So yeah, I mean, I, you're you're learning a new field. I mean, ask questions. Uh, no one ex remotely expects you to know everything. Yeah, it's definitely good to ask questions. All right. It looks like David's question got answered, but Zach says, "How did you get a recruiter to take a chance on you without experience on your resume and non-traditional school?" education so like boot camp mm -hmm. uh well carlotta was a pretty uh, pretty extraordinary recruiter but um and your two things you said aren't really true um actually i um although my my boot camp experience uh, was non-traditional i also had a, a pre-existing degree so that helped you know having a technical background in another field clearly helped uh helped me in my, my process. But I think it's really important to say that um, my resume out of Tech Academy already looked pretty good because I had a lot to say about things that I had done on my live project. You know, so, uh, you know, it wasn't super extensive, but, <clears throat> you know, I had, I had worked on a real 
production.net project. I had worked on Signal R. Um, I had implemented new features. Uh, I had written uh, I'd written the JavaScript on the page. I had implemented an Ajax call. Uh, so uh, that that's why that live project was so important is that I actually had real, you know, and not just made up, but like real useful uh, experience that that I ended up just kind of running with when I got to Intel and doing the same stuff. So, um, so yeah, you, I came out with, with, uh, you know, what, what I thought was, uh, was real experience. Awesome. All right. So how did you maintain a consistent drive to complete your projects for jobs or your company? Um, imposter syndrome and fear. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm part of it is uh, that, you know, especially at first, you're driven a lot by that, um, you know, at that time. And I'm doing that right now. You know, a month ago, I just started a new job and I have a whole new level of responsibility. And um, and and uh, so it's been a very, very busy month and a lot of long days and uh, a lot of Saturdays and uh and so that imposter syndrome can be very useful. But after that, I mean, the story was a lot about completing projects. Um, I think that you you have to, you know, you have to love software engineering. It's great. It's fun. And at the end of the day, like I say, you, you've crafted this piece of code. And it's like, this, this code is beautiful. You know, I made this. I stayed late to do this. But, you know, this is not not just a whole bunch of words on, on a screen, but, um, but yeah, I'm really proud of this. And <clears throat> when you do that day in and day out, you, you get a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of ownership in your project. And I've been lucky enough to work on a lot of projects by myself or largely by myself. So they're my projects. And so, yeah, I feel a lot of ownership and pride. And, and so, yeah, you're excited to, uh, to finish them and, and bring them to fruition. Awesome. All right. So, um, did you continue your business through your contracts? No, no. Um, no, I finished out the, the project that I uh, was working on at Profis yet. Uh, but I did not, uh, did not go out and solicit any, any more work. Cause, um, uh, cause I've been, I've been pretty busy since then. If not at work, um, at home, this whole um, room that you see behind me was studs when uh, when COVID hit. <laughs> so so everything that you see behind me is a is a hammer and nails. So now I've been I've been busy doing one thing or another. So proficiency's gone by the wayside. Awesome. So what about the security side? So cybersecurity. Did you get to experience <clears throat> or see other work that side? I probably should have included that in things I didn't learn. Um, security is really important. And, you know, especially I've done almost my whole career so far in the financial industry. Um, you know, U.S. Bank and and, uh, and Genesis. And as you can imagine, security is huge, just huge. Even at Intel, though, uh, you know, there are a lot of firewalls. You can't just go and push your code to the production server. So, um you you learn a lot about the practicalities of uh, of working with security and implementing security on the job. Uh, every place that I have worked, uh, they include the OWASP top ten in um, in their annual training, uh, and those as you'll learn in Tech Academy. Uh, again, the, that was not new. I had I had heard about that already from. Uh, from the Tech Academy curriculum, um, those are the most the ten most important security holes, <clears throat> and how do you avoid them? So um, security is something that anytime you're working for a large corporation, and in the .NET world, um, there's a good chance you will be um, that you will get a um, a handful of security, um, even if it's just how to get your code up to the production server. Um, but depending on what projects you work on, um, there will be additional uh, security tricks. Um, but yeah, that's a huge, huge topic. You could do a whole boot camp just on security. Um, and so 
you know, it, you just year in and year out, you get to learn more and more about it. Yeah, we do have cybersecurity boot camps now, Chris. <laughs> I know, I saw that. So you can do a whole, a whole boot camp on security. Whole boot camp, yep, and it's yeah. good. No, it's huge and it's very important. And it's, um, you know, just like JavaScript, you can't get away from it. Uh, you know, it's it's just everywhere. Um, so yeah, you will learn how to implement security. Uh, and you will do a lot of studying on your own. Just last week, uh, you know, somebody asked, you know, hey, have any of the senior uh, engineers implemented uh, uh, OAuth 2? I'm like, well, yeah, a long time ago. Uh, and so, uh, cause you know, somebody's having problems implementing it. And so then I, you know, I went ahead and I just, I started, uh, researching it there, uh, you know, Googling it and saying, oh yeah, that's right. That's how that works. And, um, and so, you know, every time you study it, you understand it a little bit better. So, you know, for the next few weeks, um, I know a lot about, uh, OAuth. Um, so yeah, you, it's stuff that, that you will need to, to learn. Ongoing learning. Ongoing learning all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You, there's, uh, IT does not stand still and you cannot stand still as a software engineer. That's one of the huge, and you'll be asked about this on interviews. You know, how do you, how do you keep up with new things? Um, and that is uh, one of the best interview questions that I've encountered because that is, um, that is central to your role as a, as an IT professional is how do you keep up with this? Cause um, it is a fast moving train all the time. Exponentially. Yeah, exactly. All right. And you graduated in 2016, right? Right. right. That's one of the questions. Um, and then looks like Ben is saying, I'm wondering about the seemingly enormous gap between what one would expect of entry level positions and the amount of experience and knowledge said positions list as required. I've been programming since my teens, I'm 40 now, done a few <clears> full stack <throat> applications on web and desktop, some that are actually used in real life, numerous projects for fun in various languages, and I think I could do well as a professional. But every entry level position seems still way out of my league. Uh, this is something I learned uh, during the job placement course. Um, job descriptions will um, will ask for a lot um, that they don't necessarily need. So, um, you know, for example, uh, the position at Intel uh, required a uh, a computer science degree. I didn't have a computer science degree. I did have a technical degree, though. So, um, you know, I did have an advanced uh, degree in a technical field, uh, and that was that was good enough. So, um, I've also seen on LinkedIn uh, a job description asking for uh, it was like uh, nine years of experience in this technology, and then down below they had pinned the Wikipedia article on that technology, and they said you know it's been around for seven years. So they're they're asking for more experience than the technology actually had been around. So, um, yeah, don't get too invested in what they're asking for. Um, you know, if you think that it's something that you could learn and something you could do, then apply. You know, the, the worst thing you can do is not hear from them. Um, and if you get to interview with them, like I say, that's fantastic. I love interviewing. The interviewing is super, super useful. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, they, all of the requirements on the on the job uh, application are not really requirements. They kind of list everything. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, get out there and, and stretch. Uh, I mean, if you think, well, I don't have all that, but I can learn all that, um, then go for it. Yeah, awesome. And I think it was mentioned before in one of the other tech talks that basically a lot of people just <clears throat> don't put the junior level positions on websites. So if you are reaching out for a senior level position, they might see that you might be fit for another position in their company. So you never know. So you should just try out just in case. Because yeah. why not? What's the worst thing that can happen, like Chris said? So getting that first uh, junior position is notoriously difficult. 
Um, and, you know, I was really lucky. I, I um, landed in a, in a web developer two position. So I actually kind of went into the industry at, at a mid level, um, which is why it was the first six months was so terrifying. Uh, cause I was, I was tasked with a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's hard to find junior positions right now is a good time though. You know, a lot of people are hiring right now. There's a big, big demand. Um, but yeah, that, that first junior position is just uh, really hard after that. Uh, it can still be hard as I found <laughs> after my Intel, but, um, but it gets easier all the time. Awesome. Well, any other questions? If not, you can always also, um, I just put Chris's LinkedIn in the chat box. You can always reach out for questions. If you have any further questions, we're also going to record <coughs> the meeting. So you can definitely view it later on our YouTube and I'll link that right away. But we did talk about imposter syndrome a little bit and we actually had a tech talk a while back on it. And if you guys are interested, here it is. Let me just put that in there. It's on our YouTube channel. And like I said, this is also going to be recorded. And you can see that in our Tech Talk playlist on YouTube. Let me just plug on my links like usual. Here is that. And we also have um, someone talking about domain-driven development next week. If you're interested for next week's Tech Talk, let me also put that in. But um, anyhow, I just want to thank Chris for joining us. That was an awesome presentation. I learned a lot. And thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, like I say, I, um, I owe a lot to the Tech Academy. You know, they prepared me really, really well for my career change and uh, and launched me on, um, you know, what I think is, has been a pretty successful five years since then. <clears throat> so I'm always happy to, to give back. Yeah, awesome. Well, hopefully we'll get you back on another talk soon. We'll see. <laughs> All right. No, All definitely, right. definitely a uh, big success, Chris. Really good to see you. And um, yeah, I uh, definitely really happy for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're all excited here at the Tech Academy for you. And again, thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining also. Um, hopefully I'll see you next week. But other than that, have a great weekend. Yes. Until next time. Bye, guys. All right, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Don't forget the recording, Rick.